Señoras y señores, tengan muy buenos días. Soy el coronel Pedro Rojas, oficial en retiro del Ejército Nacional de Colombia. Hoy nos encontramos reunidos en este auditorio tan especial, el aula máxima de la Universidad Militar Nueva Granada. So today here in the hall of the Nueva Granada University, we welcome today to everyone who is present here and special greetings to my General Manuel San Miguel Buenaventura who is here with us face to face. Former Dean of this important university. So I want also to welcome to all the other participants who are attending through our social media network. So on behalf of our, your Dean, General Brigadier Luz Fernando Puentes Torres, and also the General Mayor Gustavo Adolfo Ocampo Najar, Director of the Geostrategic Institute of uh, studying uh, political affairs, Iriaga. Today is the second day of this international conference of the Nueva Granada University Strategic Thinking and Geopolitics, Challenges and Opportunities to Colombia and the OTAN allies. I also want to greet to our special guests that are present here officers from the Colombian Air Force. Thank you very much for being here. Officers from the National Army, consultants, PhD, military university team. And again, to everyone who is connecting today via YouTube channel of this lecture hall from the Nueva Granada Military University. I want to greet special because this event was, was possible thanks to the military university partnership with Archipelago, 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 Archipelago of Design, AOD, one of the most important think tanks of this Western Hemisphere, and they are represented here today by one of the most important expertise Dr. Ofra Grazer, welcome. And to AOD, thanks for promoting this in their website through and also through their networks. Archipelago created one series of different events, and this is the first one, this Neo Granadino Symposium called Connect 2021. AOD Connect 2021. We're going to have six events during the next six months, and we started by October 25th. I want to give special greetings to the co-presidents and co-founders of Archipelag, Philippe Dufo and Philippe Dulu. And I know that you are following us right now and all the team of AOD, and also especially to the high... Yield Iregap, Iegap, Geostrategic and Political Affairs from the Military University, Communications Division, Human Educational Resources Division, Human Resources Division, and in general to the whole university that are allowing us to be here with you during this week. This morning, I'm going to be the moderator during this panel of operational design. The panel members are already connected. They will have 45 minutes for their talks, 10 minutes for Q&A. So please, I ask the panelists to be uh, stringent with your time. And also, we will have a professional discussion about this interesting topic, and that's the operational design, military design, that can be applied to all the fields of power. And now I'm going to introduce to you our PONAP members. Dr. Ofra Grazer, she is here with us. Welcome. 
doctor, expert in systemic operational design from Israel, expert in leadership, strategic thinking, wor work for 20 years with the militaries and defense establishments around the world, what she has called self-disruptive systems or anti-endogamic, as we will say here, opening the mind. Ofra is co-professor of the Israel defense course where so military officials from the higher state together with General Simon Nave, they prepare all these military staff and they focus their research areas going from deep operations up to special operations and all the cyber type operations, that cyber domain, developing important concepts about war games, drills, and her book, Two Steps Ahead, translated to different languages, and you can find it in many, many schools. She's a sniper official, official from the Israel Defense Forces, master's degree in political science, studies in security, and today she is with us on her lecture calling challenges uh, to Israel defense forces from the operational design perspective. After that, we will have Cor Dr. Coronel Jim Greer, Dr. Greer is currently professor. What's known as the SAMS, the big planners of the wars in the United States. Tutores teóricos. So Theoretical expert applying the designing complex, volatile, uncertain, and unambiguous scenarios. Colonel Greer has taught in different universities and military schools in the United States and for many conference PhD in education and his research was focused in the self-development of the army leader using innovative educational methodologies and web 2.0 capacities. Graduated from West Point, master degree in education from the National uh, Security from War College and executed different uh, researches for the Army Research Institute, design and develop and giving different classes about strategic perspective design and work through all the command levels. He's a war veteran and his last position was uh, chief of the major start of the multinational security transition. Today, his lecture is going to be challenges to implement the doctrine of the design in the United States Army and potential perspectives for the Colombian National Army. The next panel member is the Lieutenant Colonel Right now, he is uh, in his PhD, Grant Martin, active uh, from the United States Special Forces, uh, U.S. Com, expert in design and education, and he is also SAMS, Advanced Military School from the United States Army, work at the NATO in Afghanistan, Special Operations Command of the Army, War School, School of War. And as I said, he is right now uh, in a, on a PhD in, on public administration at Carolina State University. His research, how the organizations learn, focusing on including this, the design on the Doctrine. His lecture, the tension between the irregular and the regular work from the design view or optics. The last panel of today will be by Michelle Mastroni, 
PhD on political science. He is Canadi Canadian. His origin is from Mexico. He is professor at OCAD University, and the emphasis of that university is in on strategic and prospective innovation. His research is focused on uh, investigation before he was senior professor at Ontario Public Service, senior analyst at different conferences, work closely for governmental entities, mainly the Ministry of Defense of the United Kingdom, and also for different entities, the society and the industry in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Always his main topic is innovation and perspective. Today, his lecture will be the tension between the organic design and the established design methods. The military design is a doctrine, it's a theory to be applied in war. However, archipelago, through the different expertise, has adapted it and adopted it to apply it in the different fields of power. And we are very pleased to receive today these important lectures from experts. Now we're going to continue to sit here. Please give me one minute. I give the floor to our dear Ofra, Dr. Ofra, and also special greetings to my general Luis Fernando Puester Puentes Torres, the Dean of the University. So now we will start. The floor is yours, please, Ofra. So please, the talk. This morning, it's going to be a very interesting one. We will be discussing about all these topics. And uh, when we finish each, each talk, we will have a space for a Q&A. For those who are via streaming, and then we will have an interesting discussion, as we have done before. My general Puentes is here. We had the opportunity to be in 2016 with him in Toronto with the AOD discussing military topics. Are we ready? Ofra, the floor is yours. Jose Munoz, do you have PDF? Oh, hola. <laughs> Buenos dias. I am going to speak English. In this photo, uh, what you can see in these photographs, those of you who were here on Monday already saw it, but every time I see this photo, I'm uh, excited again. <laughs> we have on the left, we have our J2, uh, the chief of operations and the general staff. Next to him, we see the commander of our NORTHCOM command. Our NORTHCOM command is looking at Lebanon, Syria and Iran. Uh, to his right, we see our chief of general staff, Aviv Kuchavi, and the three of them are graduates of our general course and were actually in my team. And then to the right, we see our new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, and we used to be colleagues and uh, had some really interesting discussions about Israeli geopolitics. So Israel is, first of all, a very small tight community, everybody knows everyone. But uh, these are the people that I work with. Their experience becomes my experience. And what I'm going to share with you today is some uh, thoughts, some anecdotes about what these people think about when they get up in the morning. So I will begin again very shortly because I don't want this to be a theoretical presentation or a talk. Uh, I come from the profession of systemic or strategic operational design. And 
what we consider the business of generals is not to fight. Uh, they should leave the rifles to their soldiers, but they need to think. And we also think that theory is the weapon of generals. So what do they need to think about in the morning? They need to look at reality. They need to look at what has changed. They need to look at emergencies. They need to use their sensors that I've talked about in Monday. And then they need to create a new understanding about the system, about the world. You see, the world is not organized in systems. Systems are our creation. We say system thinking and we talk about the system and we say international system, but there is no system we create it. If we create it, we can change it. So if reality has changed, it means that our understanding of the system needs to change. And if our understanding of the system has changed, and our position in the system has changed, our strategy needs to change. And if our strategy is changing, our logic of operation, then our operations also need to change. The forms of warfare and to what end state we're going to uh, apply force. So I'm going to attempt to make some suggestions as to what the J2, the Chief of General Staff, the commander of NORTHCOM command and the prime minister of Israel think about when they get up in the morning in 27th October, 2021. And when we look at the reality at the system from an Israeli perspective, we never begin with Israel. We begin as wide as we can. The world is our oyster, like Shakespeare said. So. This is, um, uh, and, and, and this, we call this phase orientation, okay? We try to reorient, like we do in navigation, okay? We try to reorient in moving reality. I mean, the closest metaphor we have to the mindset of generals is of seamen, because at sea, you cannot triangulate when you navigate. So we need to find other ways to navigate these uncharted waters. So I begin with the US. The US is our greatest ally, our we have uh, military aid uh, all, all these years from the US and obviously we uh, survive in the Middle East. Part of our survival has to do with our very strong alliance uh, with America, with North America. But what happened last year when uh, President Trump and the Republican party lost the elections uh, and the Democratic party won, was it the Democratic party that we are used to look at or was it a very progressive, um, subversive, and um, very problematic democratic party from the perspective of Israel. Um, I don't know if you recognize uh, these uh, Congress members, uh, the, <laughs> the notorious four uh, who give uh, Israel a really hard time in the US Congress and look at the headline. This is a headline from the New York Times a couple of months ago. The squad, this liberal, progressive, uh, subversive uh, members of Congress of the Democratic Party, the ruling party in the US right now are anti-Israeli, are anti-Semitic, are anti-Zionist, and are trying to uh, stop any kind of vote that goes in favor and in the direction of Israel in the current presidency, U.S. presidency, okay? So the change of U.S. presidency, presidency has a huge effect on Israel and it may be also an effect on the Colombia también. Orientation, we're still in the orientation trying to re-navigate uh, this emergence. So there was also a change a couple of months ago in the Israeli government and after very long time, over a decade of ruling of the Likud party uh, with Benjamin Netanyahu, who most of the world either fears, hates, or admires, is gone. Now he's in the opposition. Uh, and he was replaced uh, by a conglomerate of parties who are only united by their hatred for Netanyahu. It's, it is called the anti-Netanyahu coalition. Um, and we talked about, um, it's okay. We talked about, uh, the prime minister, a very young, inexperienced, very smart and very capable man, Naftali Bennett, but also young and experienced, 
a new prime minister. Next to him is the the prime minister is going to replace him after two years. A very bizarre um, uh, event. And the whole uh, coalition has changed its face. Uh, a very different coalition than what we used to have a couple of months ago. This is also affecting the position of Israel, the stance, the political stance of Israel in the world. And they're still testing the new prime minister. Uh, and the prime minister is trying to figure out what he can do and what he cannot do with all these empires and other countries, rivals and enemies in the world. We're still in orientation and we're still looking at the world. Israel aspires to be part of the West, Western hemisphere or the Western world or Western oriented societies, uh, politically, socially, morally, and so on, economically. Uh, but what we witness in the summer, the entire world in shock and awe, this retreat from Afghanistan and the whole, the eyes of the entire world were looking at the screens. Uh, you can see on the right, I'm sure you remember uh, the Afghans trying to flee Afghanistan, even if it was outside of the airplanes are just falling down from the sky. I think it was devastating. It is still devastating. It still isn't over. Uh, the Taliban takeover wasn't um, expected to happen that far. And I think all the allies and all the enemies of the United States and the allies of the United States are looking at Afghanistan and rethinking the position of the U.S. in the world. So this is also affecting the world, but also Israel. There is also a weakness in the international institutions, the UN, NATO, uh, the different councils. And this is just one example, again, from uh, not so long ago, uh, an opposition activist from Belarus on a, pri no, on a commercial uh, flight, Ryanair flight, his plane is being shut down and he's taken into custody and the world does nothing about it, although this is an act of war. It's a commercial airline, and with no excuse, uh, Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, is um, shutting down that thing. But there is also fatigue of the nation states, and this is, uh, this is an image from uh, riots in, uh, in Paris, and these riots are because of COVID. This, these are, this is because of the pandemic, and this is not only happening in France, this is happening all over the world, this is happening in Israel as well. When you have violent riots uh, by citizens who don't trust the government, who don't uh, uphold, uphold the, the, the rules and the laws trying to contain the pandemic, um, and this is a, the sort of violence that I think that we haven't seen in a very long time, across the board, which is, it's not just one country who has social, economical, political problems, it's across the board. And I think societies are also imitating each other. It's, it's an experiment on a global scale, a scale because we all know what is happening in each country, maybe outside of China and, and Syria with the pandemic. And we try to either imitate or do differently than other countries. But these violent riots, because of pandemic, because of something that we were supposed to be united and, and work with the government, civilians, with the governments to try to contain the pandemic, it's sometimes uh, causing the opposite. So there is a weakness, a fatigue also in this idea of the nation state and the rule of law and law and order and governance, and we see it all over the world. There is also strategic fatigue. And now on, on the left side, uh, this is a map of the global war on terror from 2018 by a, an American uh, think tank. And it showed all the places in the world where either US forces or their partners were intervening in the global war on terror that started after September 11, 2001. But this is global war on terror is no longer the issue. It has changed to global power competition, a new era of great power competition. And I wonder why this is it, why we stop calling something which is clearly conflict, the war, a war that has enemies, a war that has rivalries, a war that means making a stand. And we're talking about something that is a lot more fluid, 
that the West may be more comfortable with, and we call it competition. Competition is war, and war are not equal. In war, we lose lives. In competition, not necessarily. We maybe lose money. But the world has started talking about great power competition, and I see it as a weakness, as a strategic weakness by the big countries, by the empires, who are setting the tone for whatever we do in the world. And there is also what I call cognitive fatigue. And when I'm saying cognitive, the way we think, I'm talking about how to interpret someone or something, uh, a state or a non-state entity or an organization and, and, and coin them back to my previous slide, enemies or rivals or partners or frenemies. How do we, how do we read them? How do we, how do we make sense of what these entities do in different contexts. And I'm taking China here as an example of two different contexts. One, I'll start with the easier one. On the right, we see China, COVID started from China. Uh, the, the, the World Health Organization sent teams to try to investigate how this pandemic started because that would have helped containing the pandemic sooner. We all know that China held information from the world for several, at least for several weeks. And the world is debating whether it's conspiracy or not. Did China share with us all the information? Um, I'm on the side, obviously, that China did not share the information. And was it man-made or not? Or was it something natural that just happened and, 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 and leaked from the lab or not? So. China deleted COVID data, gold mine impossible cover-up. Donald Trump tried to do something more aggressive uh, in regards to China, but we let China be. We don't do anything with China because China is too big of a threat or a competition to actually sanction what they did with COVID that caused the whole world to get into the spiral of pandemic that we haven't been out of a year and a half after. And on the left side, we have obviously the situation with Taiwan. The world did nothing with Hong Kong. We, we lost Hong Kong already. The West has lost Hong Kong. And now the West may lose Taiwan as well to China. The US, doesn't, the US has a policy of strategic ambiguity when it comes to Taiwan. The US also recognizes a policy of one China. China considered Taiwan part of it. But here suddenly we hear in the last couple of weeks that the President Biden is sounding more proactive or aggressive in his stance that the U.S. is going to aid Taiwan against all forms of aggression from China. So this is the same China. This is the same economic competitor. This is the same uh, health hazard. And this is also a military rival. So which, which is which, okay? And, and does the policy against China in Taiwan, is it the same as the policy against China when we talk about COVID or we talk about facilities, um, commercial uh, engagement with China? This is all the same China. And there is also operational fatigue. And here I put a photo of uh, the renewed uh, nuclear talks with Iran. The previous uh, presidency of, of Donald Trump and the previous prime ministership of Benjamin Netanyahu were against, did everything they could to stop the talks and sanction Iran. But the reversal of presidencies and prime ministers in uh, America and in Israel have gone back to diplomacy. And I think part of going to diplomacy, going back to the weakness of the West, and the strategic fatigue and the operational fatigue is that we're choosing diplomacy again when we know that diplomacy may not be enough with what Iran is doing. And that has consequences for Israel as well. And last but not least, there is Western moral fatigue. And when I'm saying moral fatigue, um, I'm, I'm giving an example here again. Uh, this is the last um, chosen human rights Council in the United Nations. And you can see the, the headlines, a record number of not free members on the UN Human Rights Council. So free democracies in, in, the, in some degree, partly free, 
and not free. There is a majority of non-democratic, non-liberal countries in the Human Rights Council, and the country they like to attack most is Israel. Although China is there, and Pakistan is there, and countries that have, <laughs> have, uh, have shown their uh, appreciation for liberal democracies. So what it means for us, so we finished a, a small tour, tour of anecdotes of global trends that may affect Israel, and now I'm looking, I'm narrowing it down, and I'm looking at the system from an Israeli perspective. So the first thing I want to say about the Israeli system these days is that it, it has always been the case, but now again with the change of, 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 of prime ministers, it's become more apparent, uh, is Israel looking east? And when I'm saying east is Russia, China, and anything that's not Western, okay? Or is it looking west? Is it looking west to the US to lead? Or is it looking at Russia and China to do business with and do policy with and do politics? And the, the reality is that Israel cannot choose. Israel needs to find out how to work with both empires and with all these grand forces because they all have presence in the Middle East. But we don't operate under the same codes when we talk to the Russians or when we talk to the Americans. And just one example, um, Hezbollah, the proxy of Iran, the partner of uh, President Bashar Assad in Syria, and our greatest, at least operational enemy, if we're not looking at uh, nuclear uh, capabilities of Iran. So Hezbollah is our major uh, military threat. Uh, it's true that since the second Lebanon war in 2006, uh, we haven't been at, at the full-scale war with, uh, with Hezbollah, with Lebanon, but it's still the, the force that is causing us the most concern so we knew that Iran was backing Hezbollah, obviously, all these years. It's part of the Shiite axis. And we know that Syria has a good partnership with Hezbollah, with Hassan Nasrallah, and, and Hezbollah helped uh, Bashar Assad during the civil war. But suddenly, uh, last week, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin made a statement that he's also siding with Hezbollah, on a local internal Lebanese issue that has to do with the explosion last year in the port of Beirut, explosion of what is supposed allegedly Hezbollah ammunition and firearms. And there is an ongoing investigation in Lebanon as to what was exactly in, in the port that exploded. And Hezbollah is trying to prevent, kind of like China and COVID, trying to prevent the truth from coming out and Putin just made a statement a couple of uh, days ago that he's going to supply Hezbollah with some imagery that are going to show that Hezbollah wasn't behind this explosion or it wasn't his responsibility. And Putin also added that he sees, he values Nasrallah and Hezbollah as an important force, a stabilizing force in Lebanon, which is clearly the opposite of what not just Israel, but any major Western force in the world, seeing Hezbollah. Now you have a present in Colombia of Hezbollah. Um, and I think it's concerning that Russia decides to make, and nothing is uh, coincidental when it comes to Russia, decides to side with Hezbollah on such an important issue. So Israel needs to wait, find a way again to navigate both East and West. Um, the second point I want to make about the Israeli system is that since we were uh, initiated, we uh, declared independence in 1948, uh, a vote, uh, uh, the vote of confidence in the United Nations was in November 47, then there was the war of independence, then we became, we, we, we were independent. And at the beginning of the pioneer years of of the state of Israel, we were playing individual sports. We thought we were, the country in the world is not gonna get help, assistance of any kind, moral, military, financial, from any country, and we need to take care of, our, of ourselves, and we, we need to do it alone. And there was also a lot of freedom in that, because we didn't need to ask anyone for permission. 
And over the, over the years, when we became more westernized and open to the world and to the coalition and to international institutions, financially, again, financially, uh, politically, uh, morally, uh, we had to learn how to work in coalitions. And now, with the changes of government, and especially in the US, but not just, we are bordering on and going back instead of team sports and playing coalition and doing diplomacy to be to do individual sports again. Now, when I'm saying individual sports uh, or team sports, again, I'm giving two examples because I cannot talk, obviously, for good reasons about what's happening right now. So I go, I, I'll talk about things that already were mentioned in the news. In 2007, we uh, bombed the nuclear potential of Syria. We took down the facilities. Uh, President uh, Bush Jr. at the time was against it. He wanted to do diplomacy. Uh, and Israel took its own initiative and did it without, basically without consent. It was the second time that we did it. We did it also with the nuclear facilities of Iraq in 1981. And all the world is looking as, as, as to what we're going to do with this emerging nuclear threat of capabilities of Iran. Some say a couple of months, some say more. No one believes that the talks are going to stop Iran from doing it. Um, one of the acts that were supposed to delay the nuclear program of Iran was uh, done allegedly by Israel and the US combined which was the cyber attack, the Stuxnet uh, famous cyber attack. So that was allegedly what I would call team sports, doing something together with our allies. And the bombing of the Syrian facilities was individual sports. And I think now we're going to back to do more individual sports. Um, another point, Israel is an island of excellence. I talked about it in a, in a different context this week. It's an island of excellence and success and very strong economy, strong, powerful military, but it is surrounded by failed states. And the latest example, as I already mentioned, is Lebanon. Le Lebanon is, uh, has declared bankruptcy last year. There is a huge uh, problem of uh, energy uh, supplies, oil and gas. Uh, their currency is very weak and people are hungry. And Lebanon used to be uh, the Switzerland of the Middle East. It was to be the jewel of the Middle East, at least the Francophone jewel of the Middle East, but it's, it's going bankrupt. Jordan is being held for many, many decades by its Western allies. It, it almost doesn't have an independent existence. Same, of course, for Syria, who is just coming out of a civil war and needs to rebuild itself. Uh, same for Iraq. Same for the Palestinian Authority and same for Gaza. And as we all know from life, uh, success brings trouble. So I'm going to give afterwards an example of what, how Israel can flip this situation. But right now it's an island of excellence and a lot of uh, source of a lot of envy from the region, which is causing a lot of turbulence. Um, and there is also this, like this gang turf war in the Middle East. So we have the Shiite uh, axis, as we mentioned, Iran, uh, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, the Houthis in Yemen, who are siding with Iran. And there is the Sunni axis, of course, of the Gulf states and the Saudi Ar Arab Saudis and Egypt and Jordan, who are siding close Close, more closely with the West. Um, about a year ago, Pre President uh, Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu succeeded to implement the initiative that is called the Abraham Accords. And what actually happened afterwards, although it was under the radar because of the COVID pandemic, all the world was looking elsewhere. Maybe that's why they could do this, sign these agreements was uh, something that was unheard of because for 40 years we were told that if we don't have, if we don't pursue a two-state solution and give the Palestinians a state, then we're not going to have normalization with the other Arab countries, which we want to do business with because there are rich countries, there are more advanced countries, uh, Arab countries definitely in the Gulf, 
like Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates, um, and also Arab countries and Muslim countries in Africa. So we want to open, it makes sense for us to open to Africa and the Middle East, although it is a Muslim and Arab world. And the Abraham Accord started that. We signed unprecedented peace agreements, although the Palestinians are still giving us a lot of trouble in the international institutions. So this is what I call the gang, the Israeli gang going with some Arab states is going up and the Palestinians are going down and the Iranian gang, I think, is trying to reevaluate itself. How long do I have on the thing? No, tango. Okay. And we also have, uh, I'm going to mention the Operation Guardian of the Walls uh, later on as well. I, I cannot help it. This is one of the most uh, photogenic photos of war, I think, of at least of 2021, uh, of gas and rockets and, uh, and the dance of the Iron Dome. But what I want to mention here is not the military operation in Gaza, although it's very interesting. I want to talk about what happened internally when these military operations were going on. And this is what we see here in the right. And I think I mentioned it also on Monday. Um, the, inter the internal threats, the internal riot, the internal instability that was caused by the military operation in Gaza outweighs the external threat. Now, Israel is a, an, a, a nation in arms. I think like Colombia is a nation in arms. And we consider our military and our external threats to be our existential threats. And I think this year, half a year ago, during Operation Garden of the Walls, we saw that the real existential problem is internal. Gaza, okay. Iran, okay. Lebanon, if we have to fight, we'll fight. But what do we do with huge population, uh, almost uh, Arab population in Israel is over 20%. And when they riot in the mixed cities, Israel is burning. And it's not burning because of the rockets, because Gaza and rockets have Iron Dome, but we don't have Iron Dome for civilian disobedience. Okay, so we talked about, I talked about orientation, gave some examples, again, of our, our need to re-navigate. And I gave some ideas of what our system, when we think of the Israeli system, what it looks like. And now I want to talk about some ideas of, of where a new alternative strategy can go. What would be some components of an alternative strategy? Now, I'm making this all up. I'm not giving you any classified information. I didn't hear it from my prime minister or the chief of general staff, but what I'm suggesting now to do is what every general needs to do. This is not something that they will be given by their politicians. On the contrary, most of the time, the politicians are not going to share with them what I'm talking about. Why? Because it's very, very sensitive and they don't, they have total mistrust and they know that that could end their career. But the generals have to do it. They have to, as Colonel Rojas said, they have to think politically, but not in, be involved in the actual politics. So this is generals thinking politically, examples. So the first one, I talked about our problems uh, with Iran and the fact that the world has gone back to the diplomatic uh, route. And when we know that the major enemy in, from, from an Iranian perspective uh, is Israel. I mean, Israel is the enemy that Iran is talking about when it is developing its nuclear capabilities, although it has other concerns as well, but they, the excuse is Israel, okay? But there are nuclear talks right now and we're not supposed, even if we could do it operationally, on ourselves as an individual sport. We're not supposed to do that. So what can we do? How do we maintain freedom of maneuver? How do we maintain operational outlets to Iran when the world wants us to stop? And part of what Israel was doing in the last couple of years is to develop this axis from Azerbaijan. Now Azerbaijan is a Muslim country from the former Soviet Union, Israel and Azerbaijan, 
don't have many, <laughs> many commonalities, uh, but they do have one, which is Iran. So um, we have been supplying them uh, with weapons. We have been supplying them with drones. I've talked about it on Monday as well. And this is our way of maintaining operational freedom under the radar when the world is telling us to stop. Um, another example. Uh, talked about Israel being an island of excellence uh, with failed states around it. And as you know, if the, the neighbor's house is on fire, then your house is going to catch fire as well. So if all the countries around you are failing, this, it, it's going to find it. You've known that. I mean, you've seen what's happening in Venezuela. I mean, it is affecting Colombia. It, it's going to be the same case for Israel as well if these countries fall. Now, Lebanon needs energy. I'm sorry that this, uh, this, is, uh, this infographic is in Hebrew, but I will explain. Just see the... Just see the symbols, okay? Israel is going to supply Jordan with more water. They just signed more water over what was agreed upon in 1994 when we signed the peace agreement with Jordan. So we're going to give them more water. Why? Because we are better at desalinization of water. And this is one of the major problems of the Middle East and the South, Southern Hemisphere, desertation. So we're going to share our knowledge of water and actual water with Jordan. But we are going to do something which is, sounds totally crazy when it comes to Lebanon. Lebanon needs gas. Egypt is going to supply Lebanon with gas. But Egypt, you can see the roots in, in yellow. E Egypt is buying gas from Israeli infrastructure. <laughs> so the gas is going to go from Israeli facilities to Egypt through Jordan to Lebanon. Now, everybody knows that Lebanon is going to get gas from Israel. Unfortunately, instead of doing 100 kilometers of pipe, it's going to do 1,000 kilometers of pipe. But this is our way for Israel to share wealth in order for the state around it not to fall. Right? Another example. Uh, we disengage. I talked about it on Monday. For those of you who are listening, go and see the talk from Monday if you haven't seen it. Um, Israel disengaged from Gaza in 2005. Palestinian Authority took over because that was the Palestinian government, but they were thrown out of Gaza in 2007. And since then, although Gaza is, is basically Gazastan, it's a state, it, it is it's more independent than the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria, it is still a failed state. Uh, after uh, every time they do an, a big operation against Israel, really the operation is not about taking down Israel because obviously they're militarily inferior to Israel. But this is just about causing enough damage that they will get more support, aid, money from the world. This is, this is why they do operations. Eventually this major escalations like we had in last May. But what happened last month, again, I'm talking, this is, this is a photo from three years ago, as part of the renewed normalization or de-escalation between Israel and Gaza. Israel is reissuing, reissuing, reissuing working permits for Gazans to come and work in Israel. Now, before there was a Palestinian authority, before we signed the Oslo agreements, the Palestinians were working in Israel. They were talking Hebrew. Israel, this was one Israel, okay? In that sense, signing of the, the Oslo agreements has worsened economically the situation of individual people and, and families that are Palestinian. So look at this quote. Uh, this is from a Gazan journalist. He says, all these years we fought them so that we can eventually work for them. So they're all fighting to get, there are 2 million people in Gaza, living in Gaza. They're fighting and, and, and screaming and trying to get, this is their ticket to, to success if they get work permits in Israel. So all this time that Hamas was trying to become independent of Israel is ending with them getting back with us again.
And, and, and that, I mean, and, and the, the thing is that the, the new dependence of Gaza on Israel is weakening Hamas, which is something that the operations, military operations, are not succeeding in doing. And now to my final model, part of the Z model. Remember I said we are orientating ourselves in a moving reality. We create new understanding about reality. We think about how to transform our strategy, and then we need to come up with new avenues of operation, of force application. And I'm, I'm just giving a few examples, okay? Uh, first of all, because I can't share, there's something that I, I shouldn't talk about, but these are examples that are supposed to open our minds. So the first one, I already mentioned the moral hypocrisy of the West, and I gave the example of the UN and the Human Rights Council, which I think Colombia also suffered from. Um, we are not going to win. We're not going to win the war of narratives with the Palestinians. We used to be the David. We had our the Goliaths. And now they are the Davids and we are the Goliaths. So we should stop trying to win the game of narratives. What, what are we winning in the eyes of the world, even if the world doesn't want to acknowledge it? We have high tech superiority. And it should trump legitimate, it should trump, it should outweigh legitimacy inferiority. And this is from uh, last year, Unicorn Nation, how Israel became a production line for companies valued over 1 billion. And to be honest, when I did, this, when I made this slide yesterday, some of the companies you cannot see. There are billions and billions of dollars being invested in Israeli companies and the products of these Israeli companies are being used all over the world. Not just ways, but many other ones. And even another point of, of Western hypocrisy, it has to do with the NSO and Black Cube um, doing espionage for countries, uh, taking over our um, mobile phones and extracting information, uh, which allegedly helped also the Saudis with uh, the assassination of the journalist in Turkey, Khashoggi. So all the world is starting to look at, and, and the governments are starting to ask questions about NSO, the Israeli company, again, another unicorn company, and if it's legitimate, legitimate their products. But all these governments are using NSO capabilities privately. They're buying it. Debajo de la mesa. Okay, so let's stop trying the narrative game as long as we have something else to sell the world that it needs, which is high tech. Another example is uh, tactical supremacy. And that's also, we are better. At, and fortunately for us, we're fighting militaries that are, weak in, that are weaker at the end of the day than the Israeli military and Israeli might. So on the left, um, the Operation Guardian of the Wall was coined the first AI, artificial intelligence operation uh, of all times, okay? So yes, we have these capabilities and some of them were used already in uh, that operation in Gaza. And, um, and again, we're losing the fake news and the battle of narratives in social media. And the last example I'm going to give, um, and, and this, is a, a, this is actually a, a problematic for us and I hope uh, Jim and Grant you're listening and maybe you'll have something to say about it. Um, there is an ongoing debate whether when we fight one front, let's say we fight Lebanon or we fight Syria or we fight Gaza or we fight the Iranians. And, and when we fight the Iranians, it's not necessarily in Iran. We can fight the Iranians where they have assets in other places, not necessarily in their state. But does it affect the kind of operation that we do in Gaza? Obviously, Hezbollah is also looking at what we're doing. The kind of uh, attacks that we are launching on, in Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon is also looking at them and seeing, trying to test the borders and what we are willing to do or not. Um, obviously, all these attacks are um, under the radar. Uh, Israel doesn't acknowledge them. Sometimes um, other agencies in the world are acknowledging, are acknowledging, acknowledging these attacks on behalf of the Israelis. But this is uh, from a few days ago. There was an attack 
on a U.S. base uh, in Syria, an Air Force base that has been used by the Americans for many, many years at Tenef, uh, by Iranian drones, attack drones. And the excuse for that attack was, again, that's what the Iranians said, it was their counteraction to Israeli attacks on Iranian targets. So we, do we or do we not want to bring the U.S. into this mess? I don't have an answer for that. This is something that, ge that we have to decide, again, generals, politicians. Is it good for us to keep the Americans busy, which means that we're attacking, but we are inviting attacks on U.S. assets as well? Or, sh or should this be something that prevents us from independent action, again, team sports and individual sports? And as you see, I chose to say, I chose. And, and at, at the end of the day, generals and politicians, they will choose in the strategy without knowing if they chose correctly or not. I chose to say that this is not an independent miscalculation, that we went too far and thus invited an attack on the Israeli uh, on the American base, but this is a way for us to keep the Americans in the region. If they think that they can leave, maybe not so. So uh, finally, um, I, I showed this video on Monday, but for those who haven't seen it again, the best uh, show in town. Uh, there is an expression uh, by Edward Lutwak. He uh, made that point after the end of the Kosovo war in the nineties. We, he was very frustrated uh, that the war hasn't ended with a clear uh, decision. And he said, again, to the Western world, you should give war a chance. Okay. So uh, this is an example of uh, should we or should we not give war a chance. By the way, in Israel, they edited it with uh, music, uh, the music from Star Wars. Uh, gracias. Listo. Ofra, thank you very much, as always. Your strategic clarity. Thanks. Well, um, I would say... To conclude what Dr. Ofra just said in general, we can see how the operational design can be applied at all three levels of war. Almost all hers or her lecture, she was mentioning of the political strategic level. I mean, the operational design Shall be, should be applied by the governments. Applied not only by the military services. Ofra, we have some questions. I was really impacted that you mentioned that Israel was an island of excellence. So you believe that from your own Israeli perspective, Colombia is an island of excellence. How you see Colombia? Given that report. Claro que... Of course. Uh, we have, uh, this is my second visit to uh, Colombia. And uh, I'm learning to know this country. Los generales no puede ver. And um, the more I understand the geopolitics, uh, the internal and external geopolitics of Colombia. And I learned to um, appreciate the, the quality of the people. I realized that you're also inviting a lot of envy from, uh, from the region. Success invites trouble. 
Now, some of it is economical, and I, I think part of uh, the, the rift between the U.S. and the Soviet Union that went on for many, many decades has affected South America as well. And I think the West is overlooking, I was talking to Colonel Rojas about it this morning uh, in another context. The world is ignoring South America. The world is ignoring Africa. The world is ignoring the non-English speaking countries. They're ignoring the potential here. Um, and, and I think Colombia has a much greater offer to the Western world than what you perceive yourselves to have. <laughs> now, I don't know if you are going to succeed in getting the Western world to learn Spanish. I know I try. I have been getting better this week with my uh, Espanol. But you have a much greater offer. But remember that the, the more you succeed and become a state, an island of excellence, the more trouble you're going to have. And it's good that you have uh, Fosas Armadas. Excelente. Gracias, Ofra. Great. Thank you, Ofra. A question from our attendees. I will try to speak slowly. Israel, can Israel maintain its survival without the U.S. support? That's the first part of the question. Second part, is it possible for the current uh, Israeli government, which is left-wing, you could say, to adapt to this new context? I mean, in the U.S., we have what we call a democratic government. There might be some coincidences, right? So what are your opinions and your thoughts on that? So we'll divide uh, the support of the U.S. Uh, to two. Although as a soldier, I should divide it to three, but I'll divide it to two. The first one is uh, the military aid. Uh, Israel is still being supplied with military aid, uh, several billion dollars uh, per year. And there was, there is an ongoing uh, debate both in Israel and in the U.S. Uh, Senate and Congress whether this military support is still needed and whether uh, or not it is, um, this money should be used for, uh, for U.S. purposes. The, the, the Israeli military doesn't need this aid. We can do without it. Not that it's not a lot of money, but we can do without it. This is a, uh, this is a connection that goes both ways because the way the military aid works is that we are supposed to only buy with it uh, American-made stuff. <laughs> so, in fact, we are uh, hurting the Israeli defense industries by buying only U.S. military supplies, but as you know, the U.S. and in any country, but definitely in the U.S., the military industrial complex, they, uh, that's part of politics. So we can do without military aid, but we cannot do without international support. I mean, the, the U.S. Uh, veto in the U.N. has, uh, especially in the Security Council, and the Security Council, the sanctions they have teeth, unlike the Human Rights Council or even the International uh, Court at The Hague. The U.S. has been backing us, not just the U.S., yes, it's also the U.K. Uh, and other allies that are shifting, you know, the interest, poli political interests are shifting over the years. So even Colombia uh, in 1947 abstained uh, in the... In the <laughs> in the decision whether Israel should be at state. You abstained, I guess. And, and last year with President Santos, uh, he made a declaration uh, in favor of uh, independent Palestinian state, but now there is a new president. So politi politics are changing. But overall, universally, I would say that Israel is going to have a very hard time if we don't have the political and moral backing of the US. So that was the first question. And the second question, already olvidado. 
It's, it's no, it's no problem. Let's let's move on. Ofra, you are a lecturer, you are instructor of generals in Israel. We have always been struck by that. This is a question, and I want to relate it to this. Is what I'm saying to that question: How does your the interaction work? The relation. Ship uh, between the chiefs of staff and the, the higher generals and the political class. The, 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 particularly in the decision making having to do with security and defense. What recommendations could you provide for Colombia? How could this, our generals, connect to our government for a better decision making? Can you tell us? Uh, some of your experience from your perspective? Uh, good question. I mentioned it before when I showed you the, the photo that I, because I also have an ego. It's not a coincidence that I showed this photo at the beginning of my lecture. Um, in Israel, I, I think most of us who are in any kind of, uh, are doing anything public, okay, or are in any position of, uh, of power can usually go with one to two degrees to the prime minister. I mean, I, I can get to our prime minister in one phone call and, or two phone calls. The generals and the politicians served in the military together. They went to the same schools. This is very, uh, this is also likely, I think, in the, in the United Kingdom. This is also the, the politicians and the public servants and, and the military generals all go to the same schools. So it starts from the school. It starts from education. They, they grow up together. And they, Israel is a, is a nation of, of about nine, nine and a half million people. Remember that 20% of them are Arab. So um, for, for the sake of this question, since we don't have Arab generals, I'm, I'm going to exclude them. And then we have 30% of the population, which is ultra-Orthodox. They don't serve in, most of them don't serve in the military for all, for all kinds of reasons. So let's say half of the population uh, which is serving the military is the material where the generals and the politicians come from. And we have a very strong presence uh, of, of military uh, former uh, generals uh, in, in our parliament, in our political system, because they're considered leaders, uh, people of action who can, who can do stuff. So first of all, they know each other personally. They know each other socially. They have family ties. This is both good and bad, but for the sake of intimacy, that is much needed to have meaningful, intimate, real conversations, what I call the, the implicit conversations, the, these coffee talks, that everything that you say when the mics are off, they will have them because they've known them. They've known their weaknesses, they've known their strength, and they've known them forever. So, so, th so this is one thing. Um, and, the, and the second thing is that we're Israelis, so you know, we just we just say everything that's on our mind. And uh, usually, maybe we wouldn't advance in the military, but we would advance elsewhere. So we, on, on one hand, we're suffering from the same malaise that every country has. But on the other hand, this intimacy and the fact that we are a compulsory service. So most of us are still beginning uh, we finish high school and, and, and we go, this is something that we share. We either do compulsory service, remain as professional soldiers, or do reserve. And even if not everyone is doing reserve, reserve everyone has a member in his household who is wearing uniform. So the whole um, attitude towards the soldiers, commanders, and general is one of great familiarity, and familiarity is the basis to intimate, meaningful relations with politicians. The, the, the last thing that I would say about it, that in the Israeli context, which is we, we are still uh, fighting wars uh, that are existential to us, unlike other countries in the world. Uh, so the politicians need, they need the generals. The, I, I think Netanyahu, 
over his terms, uh, did a, a good job that uh, incited the generals when he bypassed the military because he, he didn't trust the military. He bypassed them through uh, secret diplomacy, special envoys uh, that were his people of uh, trust, and the Mossad. Uh, but now we are going to see, and we're seeing something different because we have, again, a new prime minister we, who is less experienced, and he cannot manipulate uh, the military like Netanyahu did. So I think we're going to see something a little different. Well, Ofra, thank you so much. Please, a big round of applause for Ofra and... Um, can we please have a microphone for General San Miguel? He wants to ask a question. General San Miguel was a, uh, is a former president of this university and is a benchmark for the Colombian army. So, General, you have the floor. I will... I have lost audio. Perdí el audio del señor. Um, you mentioned the military capacities. I'm sorry, I'm not receiving the audio. Perdón, no tenemos, no tengo el audio del señor en cabina de traducción. Hola. You talked about Iran's capacity and, and destruction capacity, but you have never talked about whether Israel has nuclear capacity. Why not? Why have you not talked about it? Some things are better left unsaid. I think everybody in the world there is what we call uh, deniability. Now, everybody knows, especially since we have uh, uh, satellites covering the entire globe, everybody knows, everybody's seen what is perceived to be uh, a nuclear facility that was allegedly built with the help of uh, France uh, in the 50s and early 60s. I don't think anyone really imagines that Israel is going to use uh, nuclear capabilities, even if it has them. But I think Israel, because of what I mentioned, uh, whether Israel can trust or not trust the world, and whether Israel is an individual team player or, a te or a, an individual player or a team player, Israel cannot afford itself to be on the mercy of of anyone so whatever we can develop ourselves we should develop ourselves uh, i think we've shown great constraint in our force application over the 74 years of existence we could have done a lot more damage that, that, than we had and i keep showing these videos from uh, this video from operation guardian of the wall because i don't think any country any country would have accepted this reality for weeks on weeks on its civilians. The fact that we don't have thousands and ten thousands of casualties, although thousands and ten thousands of rockets and mortars were being launched over Israel, is because we have, as I said, high tech and technological supremacy. So we have good defense systems. But if we didn't have good defense systems, we, we wouldn't have enough place to bury all the bodies. So if we do have nuclear capabilities, it's because at the end of the day, we we'll, can only trust ourselves. And if we don't have nuclear capabilities, uh, I don't think that the world is going to come to our help. You have said that Israel had military forces able to fight 
the threat, but I agree with you. But for, for, for flash wars, but not for protracted wars, because Israel has quite a, a big reserve. And uh, we, we talk about a, a part of the army that has 11 months vacation and one month service. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm receiving very poor audio. I'm trying to do my best. So when, in the case of very quick mobilizations of 200, 3,000, 100 men, but in a protracted war, we leave many job positions unattended or many activities unattended. That is why I believe you need the support for war not to be as protracted. There are many, uh, there are many ways to, to, to counter your argument, and I, and I agree with it. The problem of, of I would say this. First, I, I don't see any country really launching an all-out war that will uh, demand 100% capabilities of all the different type of activities that the military can do. So ground operations, land maneuver, uh, taking over a country, stuff that we used to do. I don't, I don't see any politician or chief of general staff um, doing any kind of an operation like this in the near future. We do maintain our technological supremacy and our air supremacy, uh, special operations supremacy, and other kind of intelligence, obviously superiority. And, and we do cooperate with, with other militaries. We, we do have coalitions. I, I think I was referring before to, to actual uh, financial support and, and, and weapon selling, and this we can do independently. So um, you're both correct. But I, I, I don't see a scenario where the where we we're going to have to apply all the capabilities together, and I don't think that there is any country or any military in the world who has all these capabilities at at a hundred percent level. Gracias, Ofra. Gracias, mi general. Thank you, Ofra. Thank you, General, for such interesting questions.